questions before you're done? No, uh, not really. I don't think it works well. Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
years ago. But he was a revolutionary in our past. They go over to the media past yeah, Three years ago, it was over two I mean, she was win 72 awesome. to 68. Okay. So be no defense. Like 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 no Okay, good afternoon everybody. Take your seats. We'll get started. My name is David O'Day. I'm on the planning committee for the convention. I hope you all are having a wonderful time here in New Orleans. We are. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> because we have an even better time tonight and we can uh, <laughs> go to the bars and, uh, and uh, have some great food here. But we've got one more great presentation for you before the end of the day uh, that I know you're going to enjoy. Uh, the topic for our session is failure when engineers make mistakes. Uh, it, we don't. We know that. It depends on who you ask, right? Um, you know, it struck me in reviewing this session when Mike uh, Howell, our speaker, submitted it that uh, there are just too few sessions where we really focus on lessons learned. But even fewer where we focus entirely on the idea of how to learn from our mistakes and why failure is such an important thing for us to study. All the literature that you read today about things like becoming more efficient or lean or agile focus on uh, an, an important thing, continuous improvement in order to achieve betterment. And as civil engineers, we know, we all know that this is really important, but sometimes we, we simply don't pay attention to it. Our speaker, uh, Mike Howell, is a senior engineer and director of sports and recreation at Allegheny Design Services. He graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a BS in civil engineering and graduated with an MBA from West Virginia University. He has worked his way from the ground up as a contractor, a field engineer, and a civil engineer, a structural engineer, and project manager. He's a past branch president and ASCE 7 subcommittee member. He's currently the president of the Spark of Imagination and Science Center, sounds like a really cool children's museum in his, in his hometown in Morgantown. 
and uh, Pace Enterprises Incorporated, a really great nonprofit organization. So Mike kind of does it all. He uh, resides in Morgantown with his two children, and when he's not crunching numbers, he enjoys history, golf, shooting, and archery. So without further ado, here's Mike Howell. Thank you, David. So there I was. It's my first day on my first real job outside of engineering school. I graduated a couple months ago, and I find myself standing underneath one of the biggest bridges in the world, the Woodrow Wilson Bridge in Washington, D.C. Now, let me tell you something. For a kid who grew up loving construction, to stand there at 5 a.m. and to hear people beating on steel and see the cranes swinging around and see a piece of machinery drive by, I'll tell you what, it was awesome. I was so scared, I was so nervous, I didn't even know how to tie my boots on that morning. But the only thing that could have been even better than walking onto that site was in my very first project meeting, the project manager says, the Discovery Channel will be here this week to film the show Modern Marvels. Now, I'm in a room full of engineers, I do not need to tell you what the show Modern Marvels is. But it is a show that features the biggest engineering projects in the world, and I have watched it religiously all the way since the start of engineering school. And they're going to be there that week. They're going to be there filming what we call the heavy lift. So if you know the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, it is a 12-lane drawbridge. And what we are going to be doing is lifting three lanes worth of the center part of the bridge all together. 550 tons of steel that has to land within one-eighth of an inch of where it needs to go. We're going to be picking it up about 95 feet off the Potomac River, and it's got to land in between two sides that are already built. It was pretty intense. There was engineers working on this lift when I started engineering school four years ago. Thousands and thousands of hours had gone into this, and it was finally going to happen the week I started. My job as the youngest engineer, the youngest field engineer for American Bridge Company, was to stand on one of the platforms above each of the corners, and we were to measure this, the jack as it pulled this monolith of steel up off the river. And it was critical that we measured this because if that thing got out of tilt in any direction, our jacks would likely seize. We had no crane that could lower it, and even if we did, the only barge that was big enough to hold this had to take off for Florida as soon as we got it up because there was a hurricane coming up. We had one way of getting this thing up, and that was for the four engineers on the four corners to make sure that we were keeping it level as we raised it. Well, for all the, the intensity that was there, it started pretty basic, and we just started going. And almost from the start, though, there was a problem. My measurements were just a little bit off of everybody else's. It wasn't a big deal, but we're five hours into the operation here, and that piece is starting to get really, really close to that hole that it's got to fit in. And now my measurements are starting to cause some concern. So we try to adjust it. They're asking, Mike, can you go check your, can you check it one more time? Are you sure that's what your measurement is? And we're trying to adjust it, and then we're getting wrong answers. And it's getting kind of intense. We've got the cameras there watching us. We've got all the politicians from the two DOTs who are finally here to see the, the keystone of this, this project finally touched. The superintendent for the project is a gentleman named Hugo Del Costello. His nickname is Hokey. They call him the Man of Steel. Hokey scares me to death. If you can imagine the iron worker superintendent with a square jaw, the stiff chin, and the guy who really doesn't like engineers, you have pictured Hokey. Hokey comes climbing up on my platform, and within about two seconds, he lets off a really long rant about what he really thinks about engineers. And what I heard in there is the phrase that stuck with me to this day and the reason I'm standing here today. He's holding the tape measure backwards. That's right. What I didn't know as of that day was the stick rulers that we were using, which you have all seen, have two sides. This side has the sixteenth of an inch on it. This side has tenths of a foot something I never knew until that day, but I guarantee you I have not forgotten. <laughs> to make a very long story short, once we figured out that I was indeed reading the tape measure backwards, the piece was landed perfectly, it went together without a hitch, 
But you know, I learned something really important that day. Thousands of hours came down to the youngest engineer knowing which side of the tape measure to read on that very first project. My name is Mike. I'm here to talk to you about making mistakes. And that story there started a very long path for me making mistakes through my career. You know, as David kind of did our intro, uh, he's so right. We, we sometimes talk about our failures, and, that, and that, that's good. We're going to talk a little bit about that role, too. But we almost never look at ourselves and the role that we have in making mistakes. And I can guarantee you everybody sitting in this room has made some good ones and some bad ones throughout their career. So that's what I want to talk today about, is those mistakes and our reactions to them. I appreciate the nice bio earlier. Here's the one that actually shows you I'm very qualified to do this seminar. I am a structural engineer. My first attempt at structural analysis in college did not go so well, and I had to repeat the course. As I was working through college in the summers, I nearly, because I was purely careless, almost shot my boss with a framing nail gun. You've heard the measuring story. What you don't know is the story that happened literally four weeks after the Modern Marvel story where, and I, I thought I knew something when I graduated from college. I thought my degree actually taught me something I was very quickly shown in it then. I thought I could do drafting because I had had one computer-aided drafting course. My penmanship resulted in 150 shim plates being shipped to the project with the wrong size bolt hole on a Friday night at 7.30 for a, tr a crew that was coming in on triple time, Saturday morning at 7 a.m., and I had to figure out how to fix that, and I'm gonna come back to that story later. So what we're gonna talk about today is why mistakes happen. Believe it or not, even though there's a million different ways we make mistakes, there are some overarching principles that seem to come up very often. We're gonna talk about the role that mistakes can have in our career. We're gonna talk about what to do when you make a mistake. And lastly, I'd like to leave you with some strategies that you can take to your teams that are going to allow you to make better mistakes. As I mentioned, we always talk about failures. All right, my thought is that there has not been an engineering failure that has not occurred because of an engineer's mistake. There are case studies where we talk about engineering failures. I've done those seminars. They're great. They're fun. When you can dissect some of the lessons learned that you learn from these things. But what I'm talking about are the mistakes that lead up to those things. That's what we're going to be talking about here today. Yes, this is a picture of me taken from Modern Marvels, and I am holding the tape measure correctly at that point, so it must have been later on in the process. But has anybody heard of the four-inch flight? Mercury. If you have not, I highly encourage, or if you have and you've never read this book, pick up Gene Kranz's book, Failure is Not an Option. Gene Kranz, as we all know from the movie Apollo 13, was the mission control director uh, during Apollo 13 and the Apollo landings. What most people don't know is he was an engineer through Mercury and Gemini and on in, uh, into Apollo. And he has this, this book where it's essentially his memoirs of his time through the space agency, and he relays the story of the four-inch flight. Again, hundreds and thousands of hours of many engineers went into putting together the Mercury spacecraft only to have it launch four inches off the pad and fall back to the ground. I can't imagine the devastation that must have occurred to him. But you know what? He puts together this philosophy in this book that they would not let failure become an option. And that's so important when we talk about mistakes is we have to understand that still has to be the most important thing that we do. We've all seen this picture, high agency walkway collapse in Kansas City. I imagine every engineering program in the country at some point, especially if you're in a structural program, will talk about this failure. The lesson here for what we're talking about today is, yes, the failure of the walkways to collapse was indeed a very technical and very costly problem. And the lesson here is that we have a high degree of responsibility associated with the mistakes we do. But there was another lesson. There was an opinion piece that was written uh, that laid some of the blame not just on the engineer's technical mistakes, but on his response to those mistakes. Indeed. Occasionally, mistakes are going to happen with what we do. How we respond to them becomes the critical part of it. And lastly, Galloping Gertie. It's another one that we all see at some point in our programs. 
What's interesting here that I want you to remember is there was a point during the construction of this bridge where the contractors told the engineers there's an issue. The engineers ignored it. They didn't take the time to understand what could potentially be a problem and it eventually collapsed. So let's look kind of the 30,000 foot view about what mistakes are that we make. I want to establish the types of mistakes that we make. The one that I run into very often, and that's why I wanted it to be the very first slide, is not so much of a mistake of engineering, it's a misunderstanding of a constraint. Taken again from one of my own examples, I had a, a platform I was designing where the owner said he wanted it to hold a certain piece of equipment. And so we did. We designed it well. A year later, the maintenance supervisor, who had no real concept of what structural design is, chose to put something on there that was three times too heavy, and it ended up creating a problem. And the owner came back to us and he said, you've made a mistake, there's, a, there's an error here. And I stopped and I analyzed it, and we went back and we figured it out, and no, there was a mistake in our understanding of the constraints that were placed on us. The reason I don't think this is so important to establish early is most of the people sitting in this room are civil engineers. And I would venture to bet most of us entered civil engineering because of a, a desire to serve. We're good at math, science, logic, problem solving, and we wanted to take those talents and put them to use to serve society. What that can sometimes lead to, though, is a desire to assume responsibilities for things that are not necessarily our mistakes that we've made. This happens very often, especially uh, in different construction regions throughout the U.S., where the engineer is stuck facing responsibilities for mistakes that are not necessarily their mistakes to make. I, I was reading the story of the Three Little Pigs to my kids about three months ago when I was preparing these slides. But has anybody not heard the story of the Three Little Pigs? All right, in a nutshell, the Three Little Pigs story it says, the first little pig built his house out of straw. The big bad wolf came and he blew it down. The second little pig built his house out of sticks. The big bad wolf came and blew it down. And lastly, the third little pig built his house out of stone and the big bad wolf could not blow it down. The thought occurred to me as I was reading this that that is a perfect <coughs> example of what I'm talking about. And the way I, I, I thought about this, and my mind works kind of strange, is I thought, well, maybe the first two little pigs were given incorrect information about what the owner wanted, <laughs> or incorrect value for what they were allowed to spend. I'd like to believe that the, uh, the engineers, the three little pigs, knew what they were doing, but there was a mistake in the constraints for what they were looking at, which can sometimes happen with us. Let's go one step further and talk about what it is that we do. We design. Henry Petrosky, this is another book, if you've never read Henry Petrosky's book, The Engineer is Human, it should be required reading, I believe, for every college graduate. But he says, engineering is a human endeavor, thus subject to error. This is so critical. I know we think we're engineers, so we're not really human, but we really are. We are human in every aspect of it. Robert Reed, who is the editor of ASCE Magazine, wrote in an article a few years ago that we have creative chaos, and it's the fusion of art and science that is what civil engineering is. Now, if you read those statements, those don't sound like the exact statements to me. They sound like they're a little bit ambiguous. There's some margin in there. What we do is not an exact science, and there will always be margin <coughs> when you have that. The last thing that I think causes mistakes, and this is probably the one that encompasses just about all of them, is that we don't understand our own limitations. What we think we do is solve equations. And I know there's structural, there's geotechnical, there's fluids, there's environmental, there's all types of civil engineers at this conference. But essentially, we always are trying to solve this idea. We have a capacity that we need to make sure something hits. We know the demand that is going to be placed on it, and we want to make sure the capacity is never exceed demand that there's always a margin of error. That's what we do. It doesn't matter what field of civil engineering you're in. But the fact is, that's not what we do. All right? Let's start off. We have the statistical average of a capacity. We don't really know what the capacity is of that steel beam. We've got good data, but we don't know exactly. 
We don't know exactly what the friction coefficient of every part of that stream is or that pipe, but we've got good data, but it's still a statistical average. From that, we take a probability of demand, our storm recurrence, our flood zones, our live loads. These are not exact numbers. You know, no one walks into a room and has a PSF associated with them as though we design live loads based on the pounds per square foot. No, they're people. They weigh different, they have different shapes, they take up different space. But we have an average. We have a probability. Now let me stop here real quick. As a, as a profession, we do this really, really well. In fact, we do this so good the public has no idea how much goes in to those two things right there. The probability of our capacities and our probability of our domains. We do it really well and the public is very safe. We've got codes, we've got references, we've got material specs. That, that take care of this for the most part. There's always exceptions, but for the most part, we do this pretty well. Now we add in the factor of time. I would love to see a show of hands, anybody in this room, that every project you get, the owner says, you tell me how long it's gonna take for you to get this done. Anybody have that? No. So where I work, we do a lot of work for developers. And the developer already is planning the tenant by the time he signs the contract on that building. He's got no time for design. Again, we do this so well, we do the first two parts of this so well that he doesn't think there's anything associated, there's no time associated with doing it. But we know that that's not true. You know, I've been working for almost 15 years in this profession, and I can guarantee you I have never put out a perfect project. Because at some point, you run out of time. You have to make a decision, you have to get it out the door. That is a real factor. And every time you do that, you're adding margin for a mistake. There's a value associated with what we do. Yeah, it's tough to talk about sometimes, but we do it. In, structural, in the structural field, we assign menial tasks for calculations or some shop jarring of you to junior engineers because we can't afford to have the president of our company spending his hours doing the nitty gritty stuff that's in there. There's a value associated with different tasks. Now, that may change depending on where you're at. That may change, you know, depending on how your company is structured. But at some point, you're going to assign a value to an expertise to a problem. And when you do that, you've created a margin for a mistake. You've created a margin of error. This is the one that we don't like to talk about. Because we're engineers and we don't really feel anything. We don't have emotions that go into our stuff. And that is completely wrong. We are still human, like Henry Petrosky said. And we have a mental capacity associated with what we do. What we do is very stressful. On a project, you will be intellectually stressed at different points in different ways. You will be emotionally stressed. You'll be mentally stressed. And the thing is, your body cannot get stressed out. That is a complete, I actually uh, talked to a friend who's a, a health coach and I asked him about stress. And he said, your body is the best system in the world at handling stress. Because you're gonna get to the stress point that you can handle and something will shut down. Now, for those, does anybody do extreme sports, weightlifting, CrossFit, uh, anything like that in the room? All right, I see a few heads shaking yes. You know that when you get in and you are mentally stressed and you go to physically stress your body, you will not have the performance that you want. That's why professional athletes spend so much time in therapy and counseling now because they finally understood that you cannot perform at a 100% level if you've got stress in your life to build up. How that applies to us is we're dads, moms, wives, husbands, kids, we have kids, we're taking care of parents. All of that, at some point, is going to affect our engineering ability. At some point, that factors into this equation and creates a margin for mistakes. And even at the end of the day, it's still an uncertainty equation. So, mistakes are going to happen. This is a very crude way of basically just saying that. The mistakes are going to happen because of all these other things, because we are not robots, because we're not perfect, and because we have limitations to ourselves and our abilities. 
but they can still be very, very important. Mistakes can be a huge learning experience for us. Babe Ruth. What's Babe Ruth famous for? Striking out. Striking out. He's also famous for hitting home runs, which is usually the first answer I get. The fact is, in 1923, he set records for both, home runs and striking out. He is quoted by saying, of course, I would have to, to swing hard. I'm going to miss if I'm going to hit a home run every time. He got it. Thomas Edison very famously advertised that he had 900 and some different failed attempts at creating the light bulb, but he finally found how to do it around number 1,000. That one gets sold a lot.